be grateful. We are thankful to the God of heaven, uh, the great I am in whom we live and we move and we have our very being, our very existence, our livelihood. Without him, we are nothing, but with him, we are everything. And so we are thankful to God for just blessing us to be able to see this day, uh, this being the first day of the week, this being the first Sunday of the month of September. And so we're just thankful to God uh, for this occasion. If you're visiting for the first time, we want you to know that you are our honored and esteemed guest here at the Clark County Church of Christ. <clears throat> Have you ever heard the phrase comfortable in your own skin? And, you know, when you think about that, um, you know, we, we need people who are comfortable in their own skin, especially as we live in the day and the time and the age where people are insecure. Uh, people are dealing with different challenges, different feelings of uh, inferiority. Uh, and so we need to just be comfortable in our own skin. We need to be thankful that God made us the way that we are. Uh, and so you can't. You, you, you can't be anybody else. As one man said, everybody else is taken. Uh, and so you just need to be comfortable in your own skin. And so th that, that phrase means that you are confident as to who you are. You can look yourself in the mirror and you can know that, you know what? I know who I am. I know whose I am. And I know who I belong to. Uh, and so I'm just comfortable in my own skin. By that same token. We need to be comfortable in our relationship with God because when we are comfortable in our relationship with God and we are comfortable in our convictions, that's going to help us not be ashamed to be Christians. You know, when you're not comfortable as a Christian, you're going to be ashamed. And it's interesting that when you read the New Testament, one of the things the New Testament writers were trying to get Christians to understand is you just got to be comfortable in your convictions as a Christian. You have to be comfortable being a child of God. I want you to think about a couple of passages. You remember when Paul wrote Romans? Romans 1 16. What did Paul say? Paul says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believe it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Paul said he was not ashamed of the saving message. When he would write to Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse number 8, he would tell Timothy, be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel of God, uh, according to the gospel, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling. Paul told Timothy, don't be ashamed of Jesus. And then when you read Peter's writing in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 16, Peter says, if any man suffer as a Christian, let them not be ashamed, but let them glorify God on his behalf. In other words, Paul said it. Paul wrote it to Timothy. Peter said it. We don't need to be ashamed of being Christians. We don't need to be ashamed of being members of the Church of Christ. You know, a lot of times people say, well, you know what? Uh, are you a member of the Church of Christ? And some will say, yeah, why? Why you want to know? And we start backtracking and we start backpedaling. Uh, and, and so people say, well, you know what? Y'all, I tell them folks, they say y'all the only ones going to heaven. And, 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 and we start, we start trying to figure out how do we answer that? And so we become ashamed. And so the next time somebody asks you, are you a member of the church of Christ? Are you one of them folks that say y'all the only people going to heaven? You should say, would well, you like to know? Don't you want to know? Don't you want to know how to go to heaven? Because last time I checked, everybody want to go to heaven. And so don't you want to know? And so we need to be comfortable in our conviction. That's what we're talking about this morning. When you read the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 1, verse number 8, the text says, but Daniel, purpose in his heart, that he might not defile himself with the wine uh, that the king drunk, nor with the meat that he ate. Daniel had it made up in his mind. He was not going to eat what the king ate. 
He was not going to drink the wine that the king drunk. And so Daniel's mind was already made up. When you look at Daniel as a young man, presumably a teenager in Daniel chapter one, Daniel, as a teenager, had his mind already made up. He was comfortable in his convictions about God as a teenager. Now, and I'm saying this on the heels of last week where we had all of these young people here. We, we had over 30 some young people from Renaissance and we had our own young people. Young people now, today, right now, at this present age is the time where you develop your conviction. Uh, and so here's Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah. Those are the Hebrew names. That's what their mama named. Y'all know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's not their God-given name. When those young men went to Babylon, they were already convicted. They were comfortable in their convictions. This morning, we need to be comfortable in our convictions. We don't need to be ashamed to be members of the Church of Christ. That's what we're talking about this morning, comfortable in your own convictions. And so this morning, I want to look at a couple of things as it relates to us being comfortable in our own convictions that will help us as we live in a world that is contrary to the word of God, that is contrary to the gospel, that is contrary to the church. We just need to be comfortable in our own convictions. And I tell you this right now, I'm not ashamed to let people know. I'm a member of the church of Christ. All right. I'm not ashamed to let people know I'm a preacher in the church of Christ. Yes. Because I believe that when you look in scripture, God's word is right. It's not going to change for anybody. So what we got to do, we just might as well go ahead and put our seatbelts on, strap ourselves in, and just be comfortable in our conviction. That's the only thing that we got. And so we want to look at a couple things. First and foremost, when we look at conviction, let's, let's first and foremost, let's, let's define convictions. And then we're going to look at a depiction of convictions or description of the uh, convictions. And then last of all, how do we develop our convictions? First and foremost, let's, let's look at a definition of conviction. What is a conviction? A conviction is a firm or fixed belief. And, and, and so when we have convictions, that means we have a firm, it's fixed. In other words, it's set. Our convictions are set. They are, they are unchanging. But now as it refers to biblical conviction, that refers to our understanding and our acceptance and the practice and the defense of God's word in our daily lives. That's why you read passages like Philippians 1.17, where Paul says, knowing the other of love, knowing that I'm set for the defense of the gospel. Paul says, uh, when it came down to it, if it came down to me defending what I believe, I'm set. I'm ready. I can defend it. And then when you read Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 15, Peter says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Peter said, you got to be ready to give an answer. You, you got to be ready. Now let me ask you a question. How are you going to be ready if you don't come to Bible study? How are you going to be ready if you don't come to worship? How are you going to be ready if you don't come to your homecoming? Now, here's the thing, brothers and sisters. I have lived just a little bit of time, and God be thanks that I saw another birthday this past Friday. But I know this. If you won't come and get a free meal, I know you ain't cooking for yourself. If you won't come and get a free meal, you can't convince me you are home whipping up a five-course meal. The message is free. All you got to do is come and get it. And so Peter says, be ready to give an answer. You got to be ready to give a defense. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 11, he says, if any man speak, 
Let them speak as it be or become the oracles of God. When people ask you why you're a Christian, why you're a member of the church, why you believe what you believe, you got to be able to take them to the word of God and show them why you believe what you believe. Peter says, you got to give them the oracles of God. And so when you think about convictions, as we divine conviction, you know we need to treat our biblical conviction like we ought to treat our biblical convictions just like we do sports. Well, we get to talking, go to the barbershop on Saturday. A couple of weeks ago, before them preseason rankings came out, Georgia at number one, Alabama at number four, Ole Miss at number three, and so on and so on and so on. And depending on who your team is, you'll get to arguing. No, Alabama should be number one. Auburn should be number one. Georgia should be number three. And we get to arguing. Voices get loud. Why? Because we firmly believe in our team. We ought to treat our conviction just like we do politics. Go to our family members' houses. We get to talking about politics and policy and law and military and all this kind of stuff and government and governmental policy. And we get to arguing back and forth. We ought to treat our same, our biblical conviction just like that. Better yet, we ought to treat our biblical conviction just like we treat our music. We get to ask them who's the, who's the greatest singer of all. Is it Whitney Houston? Is it Mariah Carey? Is it Beyonce? Is it Chloe and Halle? We get to argue now through the generations and everybody start getting out, giving out different opinions and different views of who's the greatest singer of all. And we get to argue, but we ought to have that same kind of energy, same kind of passion as it relates to what we believe. Who is God? Who is Jesus? What did he die for? What did he purchase? Where are we going when this life is over with? We ought to have that same kind of energy. We ought to keep that same energy when it comes down to our conviction. And so when we think about our convictions, they are firmly fixed beliefs that are unchanging. Nobody should be able to change your mind about who God is. No one should be able to change your mind about who Jesus is. No one should be able to change your mind about the gospel plan of salvation. No one should be able to change your mind about what we do, why we do on the first day of the week. That's our conviction. Because it comes from the word of God. But in the second place, I want you to notice now. When you read the book of Daniel, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. I keep, I keep calling them that because that's what their mama named them. Those are their Hebrew names. When those four young men went down to Babylon, they did not compromise. They maintained their conviction all the while they were in Babylonian captivity. All you got to do is go through the book. When you read Daniel chapter 1, Daniel chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, Daniel purpose in his heart. In other words, Daniel had his mind made up before he got to Babylon. You see, a lot of times what we do, we like to get into the moment. In the heat of the battle, in the heat of the moment, then we try to decide whether, whether or not we're going to do right or wrong. Daniel purpose in his heart. His mind was already made up. You, you weren't going to change Daniel's mind toward God. Especially when you go back and you look at the culture where they were offered this meat and this drink to these idol gods. Then you weren't going to do that. Then your mind was already made up. And I'll tell you another thing. When you read verse number nine, because Daniel already had his mind made up, God blessed Daniel. God brought Daniel into a uh, to, 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 to favor and, and tender love with the prince of the union because he had his mind already made up. When you get to Daniel chapter two, when Nebuchadnezzar gave the decree that all the wise men of Babylon, all of the magicians and the astrologers and the Chaldeans and the soothsayers, everybody's going to die because nobody could give the dream or the interpretation. 
When you read Daniel chapter 2, verse number 24, Daniel said, take me in there. I'll go. I'll go in there and talk to him. I'll go in there telling his dream and the interpretation. Daniel said, send me. I'll go. Notice the conviction. He wasn't afraid. Daniel said, let me go in there and talk to him. When you get to Daniel chapter 3, when Hananiah and Mishael, uh, Mishael and Azariah were given a second opportunity, Nebuchadnezzar says, uh, is it true? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that y'all don't serve my gods? And y'all don't bow down to the image that I made? Now, 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 now Nebuchadnezzar, now, I, I heard y'all don't believe in my God. And I heard that y'all don't bow down to the image that I made, but I, I want to find out for myself. So I'm going to give y'all a second opportunity. That at the time you hear the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sack butt, the psaltery, and the dulcimer, and all kind of music. At the time you hear that music start playing, I'm going to give you another opportunity to fall down and worship this image that I made. Them boys said, man, we ain't even got to talk about this. This ain't even nothing to talk about. We ain't got nothing to talk about. They didn't bat an eyelid. They didn't flinch. They didn't go and say, you know what? Oh, give us give give two minutes. I think it's compromise. Should we compromise just in this moment? And then we go back and repent later because that was some folk thing they can do. Some folk that they can compromise and then they can go back and ask God to forgive them later. No, they said, man, you know what? We ain't even got to talk about this. The God that we serve. He is able to deliver us. And even if he don't, we still not going to bow down. They were comfortable. They were comfortable. Comfortable in their own conviction. When you get to Daniel chapter 4, one of the things that Daniel told Nebuchadnezzar, man, you got to break off your sins and you got to do right by the poor. You got to repent, Nebuchadnezzar. Can you imagine Daniel as a young man telling a world ruler who don't care nothing about God, he got to repent. Can you imagine that? Daniel was comfortable in his conviction. When you get to Daniel chapter 5, verses 22 to 28, now Nebuchadnezzar is dead. His grandson is on the throne, Belshazzar. And you remember it was in Daniel chapter 5 when Belshazzar had a party. And, and, and during that party, they went and got them vessels that came out of the house of God. The vessels of silver and gold, and they start drinking out of them. And what happened is something so unique. While they were dancing, while they were singing, while they were turning up, the text says, over against the wall, there appeared a hand that wrote on the wall. And, 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 and that hand wrote something like, many, many to carry you farther. And so I like to, I like in Daniel chapter five, when that hand wrote on the wall, that was the first text message. God sent Belshazzar a text message. And you know what that text message said? Part is over. Thou art, fade, thou art found way in the scales and balances. And so here's Daniel telling Belshazzar, God by the end your career. And, and, and one of the things that, that Daniel does when he talks to Belshazzar, he said, man, you should have known better. Because you knew what God did to your grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, when he humbled him. And so you should have known better, but because you knew better and you didn't do better, God should have now end your career. And it's amazing. That's exactly what happened. Belshazzar died in Daniel chapter 5. When you get to Daniel chapter 6, you remember, they were trying to figure it out. How is it that Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, how is it that these men don't follow our laws and our codes? So what they did, they plotted, they schemed, they planned. They said, I tell you what, we know how to get them. We know how to get Daniel and entrap him, but we got to get him with his God. So what they did, they went to Darius to me and they told him, what you need to do, you need to write a law. That nobody can pray to any God except your God. 
And, and so Darius, he wrote the law. They signed it. And one of the things about the laws of the Medes and the Persians, they don't change. Their laws were unalterable. They were unchanging. And so when you read Daniel chapter 6, verse number 10, the text says emphatically, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his home and went into his chamber. And the Bible says he kneeled upon his knees and gave thanks before his God three times a day as he did before time. But the point of the matter is when he knew that the writing was signed, when he knew that the penalty was his life, when he knew that the penalty was to be cast into the, the lion's den, he went home and prayed anyway. Three times a day, as he did a four time. Why are we saying all of this? Because when you look at the Old Testament, and one of the things that we learn from the Old Testament is uh, the Old Testament is for our learning. And so these young men, even in captivity, they were comfortable in their own conviction to the degree that even though their lives were threatened, they were not going to compromise. Right, right. They were not going to be in. They were not going to offend their God by compromising their convictions in him. But then, where did they get their conviction from? Why were these men so strong in the face of adversity? When you read Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, Daniel says, I read and I understood by the number of books that Judah and Jerusalem were going to uh, uh, spend 70 years in desolation, in captivity. You know where Daniel got his conviction from? What he is quoting in Daniel chapter 9, verse number 2, he is quoting from the book of Jeremiah. Where Jeremiah prophesied that God's people, when they disobeyed God, they were going to go into captivity for 70 years. And so here is uh, Daniel and his friends. They are in captivity because God was right. And Daniel said, if we would have just read what Jeremiah said, we would have known better. Daniel and his friends got their convictions from the word of God. They got their convictions from what God said because God's word is always going to be right. And so they knew it, they read it, but here's the thing. Even though they were reading it, even though it was true, they couldn't change it. Because sometimes, even when God's word is right, we still got to deal with consequences. And so here it is. You see these young men and their conviction. How is it that these young men could be so strong and dedicated toward God because they knew God was right? But then, when you get to the New Testament, the New Testament talks about <clears throat> convictions. Why are convictions so important? The Bible describes conviction in a number of ways. Look, if you will, look at Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs 23. Proverbs 23. Proverbs 23. And notice what it says in verse number 23. Proverbs 23. The proverb writer says, buy the truth and sell it not. Right. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Notice what he says. You got to buy the truth. Truth comes at a price. He says you got to buy it. And once you buy it, and, and once you acquire it, and once you gain it, he says, don't sell it. Sadly today, some folks not buying the truth. And if they buy it, they're not selling it. They're just giving it away. He says, you got to buy it, and then you got to hold on to it. Because Jesus says, and ye shall know the truth. And the truth is the only thing that can make you free. But the problem is some folks can't handle the truth. They can't handle it. 
He says, buy the truth and sell it not. Don't buy it and get rid of it. You, you know how it is, many times. I mean, we understand this. We've seen it in our family. We, we've seen it with, with family members and friends and loved ones. People buy stuff. They buy expensive stuff, jewelry, necklaces, rings, earrings, and then they get into a pinch. Guess what they do? They take it to the pawn shop. That's exactly what people do with the truth. And you know when you take it to the pawn shop, you don't get nearly the same amount that you paid for. Truth is that important. He says, buy the truth and sell it not. Young people, buy the truth. Sell it not. Don't compromise your convictions. Don't compromise your integrity. Don't compromise your morals. Don't compromise your values. Don't compromise your virginity. Buy the truth and sell it not. He says, and also wisdom and instruction and understanding. And so you start thinking, well, preacher, there's a lot of things in the New Testament for us to believe. What is it? What's the foundational thing that we need to believe that we need to hold on to? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Look at Ephesians chapter four. Look at Ephesians chapter four. If there was ever a thing, a text that we needed to, 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 to be able to uh, go to, to hold on to in, in, in a nutshell, to let people know what we believe and why we believe it, Ephesians chapter 4. Notice Ephesians chapter 4. Paul will say, beginning at verse number 1, Ephesians 4, 1. Paul says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. All right. Do you not realize that, that we are part of a vocation. We're, we're part of something that is ongoing. It, 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 it's, it's a practice. It's a discipline. Paul calls it a vocation. Well, Paul says we, we should walk worthy of this vocation. Well, how are we supposed to walk worthy of this vocation, Paul? With all lowliness and meekness and long suffering, forbearing one another. Now I want you to think about something. Haven't you heard this phrase before? Did these two things join together? Lowliness and meekness. I remember a man by the name of Jesus who says, I am meek and lowly. Then Paul says, with long suffering, forbearing one another. Paul is writing this to Christians. To members of the church, we need to be reminded from time to time that we have to be long suffering with one another. We, we got to we got to forbear with one another. I mean, I know we love each other, and I know we respect one another, and I know we want what's, what's best for one another. But sometimes we offend one another. Sometimes we say things we don't mean to one another. Sometimes we do things to one another that we don't quite mean. And so Paul said we got to be long suffering to one another. Because a lot of times things end up happening in the church. And then you know what happens. When you really sit down and you think about it. Why are we at odds? Why are we dislike each other? Why are we not talking? And it could be something as trivial as our children got into it. All right, all right. You mean to tell me y'all hadn't spoken to each other in 10 years because y'all children got into it. Y'all children. When they were 10 years old. Her son hit my daughter and I had to go off on them. And now those 10 year old children, they grown, they got 10 year olds and y'all still haven't spoken. Paul says we have to be long suffering with one another. We have to forbear one another. We understand what forbear means. If you go to college and you taking out student loans, you know what forbearance means. You, you know what it means. It, it don't mean you ain't got to never pay. <laughs> It just means you, you, you need a little bit more time. 
And sometimes we need a little bit more time one with another. And so Paul says, the reason why we need to be long-suffering and forbear one another, we are endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. What we are trying to do by being lowly and meek and long-suffering and forbearing one another, we try to keep this thing together in the bond of peace. Because if we ever get outside of ourselves, we will tear this place up. We got to be long-suffering. We got to forbear. We got to be lowly. We got to be meek. The reason being, because every one of us got some ideas in our, in our heads. Every one of us... If you were to ask every one of us individually what the church should be doing and what you think about a church, you'll get a hundred different answers. But what we are trying to do, we are trying to work together. We're trying to walk together. We're trying to be together. Why? Because of the spirit of unity in the bond of peace. Now, Paul says, understanding that, when you get to verse number four, we, we, we don't got the, the, the practical part out the way. Now let's understand the doctrine. There is one body, one spirit, even as you're called and one hope you're calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who is above all and through all and in you all. Paul says what we got to do, we got to keep that intact. Paul says there's one body. What's the body? In Ephesians, the book, the book of Ephesians, the body is the church. Yeah. Chapter 1. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And have put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head of all things to the church, which is his body. Paul said it, not Cameron Freeman. Paul says it's only one church. There's only one body. There's only one church. Now, you can argue with Paul all day if you want to. You're still going to be wrong. Paul said there's one body, the body is the church. You can deduce that since the body is the church and the church is the body, if it's only one body, it's only one church. Now, why are you going to be mad at us? It's amazing that people who mad at us got the same thing written in their Bibles, but they say, you know, what? Well, y'all think y'all the only ones going to heaven. No, Paul said there's only one body. Then he says there's only one spirit. Even as you're called and one hope of your calling, it is the aim of everybody to want to go to heaven. And then he said, there's one Lord. You ask anybody in Christianity, is there more than one Jesus? Across the board. They're going to say, no, there's only one Lord. One Lord Jesus Christ. Then he says, there's one faith. There's one system of faith. One body of truth. Well, you know, people say all the time, well, you got your faith and I got my faith and they got their faith. No, Paul says there's only one faith. There's only one faith. And then he says, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. That one baptism is the baptism that you are baptized into Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. Not a Holy Ghost baptism. Not a baptism of fire. It's the baptism that puts you into that one body. And then Paul said, there's only one God. Now, if there was some foundational thing that you needed to know, to stand on, to be comfortable in, is Ephesians chapter 4. You know what is interesting? If you don't believe me, you can Google this as soon as you leave home. You know who also else believes Ephesians chapter 4? The standard manual of the Baptist church says that at one time, there was but one Lord one faith, and one baptism. That's in the manual for the Baptist church. But my question is, who changed it? Why did they change it? And it also says that at that time, there were no differing denominations. That's in the Edward T. Hiscock manual, the standard manual for the Baptist church. You see, brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors, the Bible is right. So what we got to do if we want to be right, we got to study it. We got to practice it so we can be comfortable in it. And so Paul shows us that the foundational teachings for the church are things that we can readily understand. And it's interesting that people will still argue with you up and down day and night. 
The Bible says this and the Bible says that. No, the Bible says what it says. What we have to do, we have to understand it and we have to appreciate it and we have to apply it. Now, if you're there in Ephesians chapter 4, what I want you to do, I want you to drop down. Drop down, if you will. Look at verse 14 and 15. Now, Paul just got through talking about all these things that are one. One body, one spirit, one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. Why does Paul do that? Because when you look at verse number 14, he says in verse number 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Paul said that we don't need to be children anymore because if we stay children, what children have a tendency to do, children will follow anything. They will go anywhere in every generation. In every generation, one of the primary things we teach our children, don't speak to strangers. Reason being, because strangers can deceive them. Strangers can trick them. Strangers could, could, could hoodwink them. So we teach our children, every generation, don't talk to strangers. Don't take anything from strangers. Don't go with strangers. Why? Because children can easily be misled if they talk to strangers. So Paul says that we no longer be children. Why? Because there's some false teachers out here in the world that will mislead us. We'll be going over here. We'll be going over there. We'll be believing everything. And that's the reason why we need to believe Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. So that we won't be misled. Ephesians 4, 15, but speaking the truth in love. That's the reason why we need to have our convictions. Paul is showing that there's a reason why we need to have our convictions and be comfortable in our own convictions. You don't want to be misled. You, you, you don't want to go down that road of destruction. And, and, and so this morning we talked about in Bible class. You don't want to be blind, following the blind. You know how crazy that looks? I mean, you can you visualize that? A blind person holding the arm but showing somebody else who's blind and you say, well, what, what you doing? Oh, I'm following him. I'm following her. That looks crazy. And Jesus still said, leave him alone. The blind follow the blind. They both fall into the ditch. So you don't want to be misled. That's why you need to develop your own convictions. And then finally, for the sake of time, how do we develop our convictions? How do we develop our convictions? A couple of things here. We need to believe a few things. Number one, we must believe that the Bible is the word of God. All right. We got to believe that. That's, that's foundation. We have to believe it. As a matter of fact, without faith in that, we can't even please God. But we have to believe that the Bible is the word of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 through 17, Paul would remind Timothy. You remember now, Timothy, Timothy had a rich heritage. His grandmother, Lois, and his mother, Eunice, they, they, they had taught him the scripture since he was a child. Uh, they had a great faith. And, and so Paul reminds Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, and that from a child, thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise into salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. What did Paul want Timothy to know? That all the scriptures are given by the inspiration of God. What we are reading in these 66 volumes came directly from the mind of God. Amen. That's what Paul wanted Timothy to understand, that these writings, these sacred and divine writings, they came from God. They were inspired of God. They were God breathed. 
as it were. That's what the word means. That's what the word inspired means. They were God breathed. They came from the mind and the mouth of God. And so God gave man his will so that man could know how to serve God and how to please God and how he can walk in fellowship with God. In the second place, in order to develop our convictions, we must believe that this word is right. And so it does us no good to believe that it came from God. But then sometimes we turn around and say, you know what? Well, you know what? Uh -uh. The Bible is full of contradictions. You won't find not one contradiction out of these 66 books. Not one. Not one. Because it came from God. And it's right. The proverb writer says every word of God is pure. That word pure means it's right. It's proven to be right. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust into them. And then he says in verse number six, add thou not into his words, lest he reprove thee and thou be found a liar. God don't need our help. He, he says, don't add to his word. God don't need to consult Cameron Freeman. God don't need to consult you. It ain't nothing that we can add or take away from God's word. He says, don't add to it. Don't subtract from it. Because God does not need our help. What happens a lot of times? We buy suits, we buy dresses, we buy clothes, and sometimes the, the, the fitting may be off just a little bit. What do we do with them? We take those clothes to a seamstress. And what do they do? They alter the clothing, the sizing. And so God says, you can't alter my word. You can't change my word to make it fit you and to fit your lifestyle. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. Don't alter anything from my word. God's word is fine just as it is. And so he says, it's pure. It's pure. It's right. Another thing that we need to understand is the word of God is unchanging. Unchanging. It's not going to change. Look at Psalm 11989. Psalm 11989. God's word is not going to change. It is not going to change. We look at Psalm 119.89, but then we look at Romans chapter 3. Psalm 119.89. The psalmist says, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. It's settled. It's set. It's fixed. So, so when you read Psalm 119.89, what I want you to visualize, what I want you to picture, I want you to visualize them guys out there on the street pouring concrete. When they pour that concrete and they put that rebar in and they leave it alone and they put them orange cones up and they put them lines up and say, do not cross and they let it kill. That concrete gets set. It gets fixed. And any change that needs to be done, they try to correct it before it sets. Because once it's set, it ain't nothing you can do but break it up in order to change it. God's word is set, is settled in heaven. There's nothing man can do to change or fix or alter it. It's unchanging. But now with that being said, look at Romans chapter 3. I want you to mark Romans chapter 3. Because if it was ever stated so simply that God's word is unchanging, it's in Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Notice what Paul says in Romans chapter 3. In verse number 1, Paul will ask a question. Paul says, What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Now, when Paul writes the book of Romans, Paul was trying to convince Jews who had every ample opportunity to accept Jesus as their Messiah, as their Lord in Christ, they had every opportunity to become Christians. So Paul is now asking a series of questions. What advantage then have the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Reason being, Jews did have an advantage over Gentiles. Circumcision did profit. Then he goes on to say, he says, much in every way, chiefly because unto them were committed the oracles of God. God gave the Jews his law, his commandments, 
his precepts, his statutes, his testimonies, all of his prophets, his angels, all of the feasts, everything in the Old Testament. So they had an advantage over the rest of the world. But then Paul says, for what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith or the faithfulness of God without effect? In essence, what Paul is saying is, with all of the advantages that the Jews had, what if they didn't believe what God said in the Old Testament? Shall their unbelief change the faithfulness of God? Absolutely not. The point of the matter is this. God has given us his word. And God has said a variety of things on different topics, different subjects. But what if some folks don't believe? Is that somehow going to change God? No, sir. Not at all. God has said things about marriage. What if some people don't believe that marriage is between a man and a woman? Is that going to change God? Absolutely not. God has said some things about salvation. What if some people don't believe what God said about salvation? Is that going to change God? Absolutely not. God has said how we should rear our children. Well, what if some folks don't believe that? Is that going to change God? Absolutely not. Man's unbelief does not make the faith of God without effect. Your unbelief will not change what God said. And so God has shown that time and time and time again. If a man or a woman won't accept it, it's not going to change because they don't want to accept it. What has to happen, man has to change. And what God will do, and we'll find this out next week, a person, group of individuals, they can persist in unbelief and denial and rejection all they want to. And it's not going to change God. When you read Romans chapter 1, verse 24, verse 26, and verse number 28, the text says God gave them up. God gave them up. God gave them over to them. What God will do, God will give you up to the very vices, the very things that you want, that you enjoy, that you like, and then he'll turn around and judge you for it. But he's not going to change. Man has to change. So because you choose not to believe what God said, God is not going to change what he said. God's word is unchanged. In our Bible class this morning, we, we, we read an account from the book of Nehemiah. In the book of Nehemiah, in the days of Nehemiah, they read where they found out that they had not practiced a feast of booth after thousands of years. Let me ask you a question for those who were in our class. During that interval of thousands of years, did God ever change what he said about the feast of booth? No, sir. Absolutely not. It's been almost 2,000 years since Paul wrote Romans. You know what hasn't changed in 2,000 years? Romans chapter 3. Now, times have changed. Technology has changed. Fashion has changed. Hairstyles have changed. Uh, you, you go back and you look at some of your old pictures. Some of y'all ought to be ashamed with some of them half style y'all used to wear in the 60s and 70s. But you know the sad thing about it? They coming right back around. <laughs> now, all these things have changed. Vehicles have changed. Everything has changed. But the one thing that has not changed is what God said. It's going to be the same. It's going to read the same just like it read 2,000 years ago. That's why Jesus says in Matthew chapter 23, heaven and earth shall pass. But my word won't pass. It's not going to change. Generation will rise. Generation will fall. And God's word is going to remain the same. It's going to be the same until Jesus Christ get back. And it's going to meet us in the judgment. And it's going to read the exact same way. Can you imagine getting to the judgment? And as, as John talked about in Revelation chapter 20, the books were open. You know this book going to be there. This book going to be open. 
So what I would suggest that you do, you go home and you study this book so you can pass an open book test. I know I got several teachers in here. And I know sometimes teachers like to be generous, especially at the end of the year, because they're tired of dealing with y'all children all year. They give open book tests, and some students still flunk open book tests. How in the world are you flunking open book tests? Because you didn't pick the book up and open it. This book going to be open, and sadly, in eternity, some people are going to fail this open book test. Because it's not going to change. So what we have to do, we must recognize that the Bible is the word of God, that it's right, it's unchanging, and then we must apply it to our lives. James 1.22, James says, but be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only. What is James talking about as we close? Y'all see these black words? Y'all see it? At some point in your daily life, these black words got to come off this white page and become in color in your life. That's what James talking about. When he says be doers of the word, these black words can't just stay black words on a white page. We got to apply them. We have to do them. We have to practice these things in order for us to get stronger in our convictions every day. But when we don't open the book, when we don't read, when we don't study, we're never ever going to be comfortable in our convictions. As we bring this to a close, we got to remain comfortable in our conviction. I think this thing is, the battery's not working. What we need to understand, we got to become comfortable in our own conviction. We got to be willing to let people know why we believe what we believe. You know, when you think about that in reality, when we start talking about religion and religious matters, you'll be surprised. Other people are comfortable in their conviction. You ever talk to somebody who's Baptist? You ever talk to somebody who's diehard Baptist? Some people will tell you, I was born a Baptist and I'm a die Baptist. Some people will say, you know what? Some people will go so far as to say, you know what? Uh, I'm Baptist born, Baptist bred, and Baptist, I'm going to die. Some people will go so far as to say, what? Well, you know what? My pastor, my reverend, my bishop, they'll talk about their preacher's wives because they're comfortable in their conviction. You ever talk to a Muslim? Somebody that's a Muslim? They believe in Allah as the one true God? When reality, Allah and the God of heaven, not the same God. Go and check that. Allah is the moon God. But the God of heaven, the God who gave us his Bible, he is the creator of the world. But Muslims, they are comfortable in that conviction. You ever wake up on a Saturday morning while you're cooking your breakfast and you're eating your eggs and you get that door, that knock on your door and it's Jehovah's Witnesses and they come to your door with the watchtower and they got that little pamphlet and they tell you only 144,000 people going to heaven. You know why they say that? Because they're comfortable in their conviction. You ever talk to somebody who's Seventh-day Adventist? Who believe we ought to be worshiping on the Sabbath day instead of Sunday? Why do they say that? Because they're comfortable in their conviction. The reason I'm sharing these examples with you, don't think we the only ones that should be comfortable in our convictions. Other folks are as well. And so if they could be comfortable in error, we should be comfortable with the truth. And so what we need to do, we need to buy the truth and sell it not so we can be comfortable in our convictions and we can let people know why we believe what we believe and we won't have to be ashamed of it. Nine times out of ten, on a day like this, especially with the weather the way it is, we're going to leave here we're going to go to a restaurant, and people are going to see you dressed up in your Sunday best. And you're going to be sitting next to somebody. You may bump into somebody, and they can say, oh, you went to church today. And what church you went to? What church you go to? And you're going to say, uh-uh, 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 uh-uh. <laughs> uh 
And the reason why you're going to be uh, 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 because you're not comfortable in your conviction. So what you need to do in order to get comfortable in your conviction, you got to start reading. Got to start studying. You got to start growing. I understand this don't come overnight, but you got to start somewhere. And it starts with realizing that you're not comfortable in your conviction. So today, don't you want to start gaining conviction so that you can let people know exactly what it means to be a Christian? Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, if you are ashamed of me in this world, I'll be ashamed of you in the next. It'll be a dreadful, terrible thing for you to be ashamed of Jesus, the man who died for you, the man who laid down his life for you, and then you turn around and be ashamed of him because you're not comfortable in your convictions. There's more than Why don't you accept what Jesus did? Jesus died for you. He was buried. He rose again the third day, according to the scripture, so that you can be saved, so that you can be a member of his body, his church. As we read in Ephesians chapter 4, it's only one. When we leave here today and come back next week, Lord, when it's still going to be one. So what needs to happen is man needs to accept that one plan, that one faith, that one gospel, that one saving message. How do you accept it? You believe with all of your heart. Be willing to repent. Confess that Jesus Christ is the one Lord the one savior, make that confession before witnesses and then identify with him through that one baptism that puts you into the one body. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. If you're subject to invitation, why don't you come this morning while we stand together and sing our invitation song. You've been to Jesus for the